You are listening to the Wealth Formula Podcast with Buck Joffrey. Get ready to change your life. Welcome, everyone. This is Buck Joffrey with the Wealth Formula Podcast. Before we get started with today's show, I do want to tell you that I have a special report up on the website, wealthformula.com. Basically, it is a special report that tells you, the high-paid professional, how you can legally save thousands of dollars in taxes. And these are pretty much sort of ways that a lot of people don't know about. So I encourage you to go there, wealthformula.com, and download this special report. So today's show, though, is about real estate. And one of the reasons we do talk about real estate a lot is, uh, for one thing, it's a real asset. It's not like investing in the stock market and you know having your money go up and down based on emotions or what's happening in China, global issues that have nothing to do with the asset that you own. Real estate can take many forms, okay? You can be a person who invests in real estate by just buying a house and renting it out. You could be a person who buys it and fixes it up flips it. I guess that's still, uh, I don't know if that's investing, but it's certainly real estate. You also can go to the next level and look at four unit buildings, or you can start getting into the larger apartment buildings. These are all real estate related activities. You can also get into office real estate, office space. You can get into industrial. My favorite, frankly, is multifamily real estate, and that's because people always got to live somewhere, right? Specifically, I like multifamily real estate that is in the B and C classes. And what that means is people who are not paying top dollar for real estate, you're really focusing on people who are working class because they need to live somewhere. And people, when times are bad, they move from A down to B and the Bs move down to Cs and the Cs move down to Ds. But people got to live somewhere. So it makes it a very good investment. Now, once you get past the idea of investing in real estate yourself, because for many people, that's very intimidating. I mean, you might be a busy, physician or an attorney, and you're thinking, how in the world am I going to do that? Well, I can tell you, you can do it. You just have to make the time and make the commitment to get that education and you can do it. But if you really don't want to do it, there are other ways you can invest alongside guys who are actually putting deals together. And these guys are called syndicators. And their job is basically to take a great big deal, put it together, use all of their team, all of their know-how to create a deal. And then you can come alongside them and invest as a limited partner. Now, the value of that is not having to worry about all of the management issues that go into real estate, but at the same time, taking advantage of the cash flow and also the tax advantages. You could also, instead of investing alongside a syndicator, actually become a syndicator and that I think might appeal to some of you out there, and hopefully our guest today is going to give you some ideas of what that's like. My guest today is one of the most successful uh, multifamily syndicators that I know, so when we come back, we're going to talk to him, get his insights on what it's like to be a syndicator, what it's like to be successful in that area, and what it's like to invest in a syndication. So when we come back, we will talk to Mr. David Zook. If you love real estate and have always wanted to own your own business, listen up. The Real Estate Guys and their panel of experts want to teach you how to go full-time fast in the real estate syndication business. These next few years may go down in history as one of the best times ever to acquire investment real estate. There are deals everywhere if you know where to look and how to assemble the resources. The Secrets of Successful Syndication Seminar will show you how to make big money doing big deals from a team of experts that have syndicated projects totaling more than $1 billion. Don't wait for someone to give you a raise or create a job for you. Attend the secrets of successful syndication and learn how to build a team, raise capital, find deals, and make full-time money in six months or less. Go to realestateguysradio.com and click on events. All the big players use syndication as a way to diversify risk, optimize profits, and earn big money. You can too. Go to realestateguysradio.com and click on events. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, My guest today is a successful business owner and experienced real estate investor and syndicator with over 2,300 multifamily apartments in his portfolio that are spanning multiple states and countries. He's also a published author and has been a guest speaker at the International Business Conference, the Jason Hartman Real Estate Mastermind, and on the Real Estate Guys radio show. So please welcome... 
Mr. David Zook to the Wealth Formula Podcast. Dave, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me, Buck. You bet. I'm glad to have you. Now, listen, I got to ask you one question before we start. Every email I get from you, there's something in there about building chicken coops. And there's a book in there. It's like building chicken coops for dummies or something. Can you just tell me what that's all about? Yeah, so it's a small part of our business. We were marketing and building chicken coops. It came out of the 2008 recession. People really got conscious about being self-sufficient. So we rode that wave for a number of years and we still sell them. We have since outsourced the building part of it, but we still sell them on a and have a national presence. We've got buildings in all of the lower 48 states. So it's a, it's a very small part of our business, but I got approached by Wiley and a good friend of mine to write a book about chicken coops. So I did it. That's great. I think that's interesting is, you know, you talked about when we met how we had a lot of similarities and my background is, of course, in business as well. I'm starting multiple companies. So you were a successful business guy before you got into real estate. So tell us what got you interested in real estate? Well, you know, it's interesting that you asked because I made a conscious decision early on that I was never going to invest in real estate. And I guess most of the reason for that was I watched my dad invest in real estate. And, uh, you know, I can remember clearly looking back and seeing him as a landlord and he self-managed a lot of his properties. And, uh, you know, I I saw that and just decided, you know, that's something I don't want to get into. So while I was an investor and an entrepreneur from about as far back as I can remember, I started investing in businesses. I founded a few of them. I bought some. I joint ventured with some guys on a couple of them. I sold a few of them. And, you know, after a couple years, some of them started, you know, really doing really well. And one of the companies that I founded, Horizon Structures, as a sales and marketing company that sells some of the products we manufacture in our family business, but we also got connected with affiliate builders throughout the country. A few of them in Pennsylvania, some of them in South Carolina, Tennessee, Texas, California. And these affiliate builders would build these products for us which would give us much greater reach to our target audience. So it, it allowed us to service any customer throughout the country, you know, including military bases. We've got a couple of GSA schedules. We do a lot of business with government. Most of our business is with just the retail customer. But the problem that I was having that was a great one is that we were selling a lot of products, making great money. We had no tax protection. We didn't need to buy equipment or inventory. Other depreciating assets like a normal business is uh, a manufacturer. So we were generating a lot of profits. We had three employees at that time, a couple computers and a server, and that's about it. So in the run-up to 2007, I was really getting involved in some other deals. I was, I was a private money lender getting paid 15% interest. Real estate flippers call me all the time. But I was having a lot of fun with it. I mean, it's the easiest way possible to make money is to be a private money lender at 15%. When you make those loans against assets that you'd love to own anyway and you do it right, it's a very easy way to make uh, good money. But... Uh, Along came the tax man. I can still remember the place I was standing when I got the news on April 13th or 14th that even after paying my quarterly taxes and taking whatever depreciation I could, I still owed a few hundred thousand dollars in tax. I just decided right there and then that that wasn't going to happen to me again. I had been taught from the time I was a kid that you make a lot of money, you got to pay a lot of tax. I went on a self-education binge, and, and Buck, I think this is something you can relate to. I've heard you talking about how you read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and I did as well. And after I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, I read just about everything else Robert Kiyosaki ever wrote. I was listening to a few podcasts and came across the Real Estate Guys radio show. That helped me a lot. After listening to them for a while, they started talking about their investor summit at sea. And soon after they announced that, uh, they announced that Robert Kiyosaki and his whole team were coming aboard. And I thought, you know what? What better way to learn from the guy that's telling me that I can make millions of dollars a year without paying any tax than to be there on board with him for a week with his tax guy, with his real estate guy, you know, be the sponge. So I did. I, when they announced that Robert Kiyosaki and his whole team was coming on board, I jumped on. So on the ship, I got introduced to Tom Wheelwright as Robert's CPA, who's the founder of ProVision, a CPA firm. Tom is a rich dad advisor and part of Robert Kiyosaki's team. And I'm now a client of ProVision as well. But he said a few things on the week-long summit at sea that stuck with me. One of the things he said, if you want to change your tax, you got to change your facts. So I realized 
realized then that the reason I was being taxed is that I was behaving a certain way. And if I started behaving differently, I would get taxed differently. And I soon started to see that real estate was a great way to help shield my income from being taxed. So in a nutshell, that's why I got into real estate. A couple reasons. One is cash flow. Uh, number two is depreciation. But in the beginning, it was mostly for tax protection through depreciation. That's interesting. We do have a lot of common action. My dad was a landlord too. And growing up, I had absolutely no interest in doing what he was doing. He was actually sort of a slumlord. And, you know, I say that in tongue in cheek. In reality, he was in low income property and, you know, he made a lot of money. Listen, I went to college and medical school and through residency and I had zero debt afterwards. And I can thank my father for that, whether I liked what he was doing or not. The other thing that we have in common is I also am a provision client. And so this I didn't is, know that. Well, they set up my tax structure. They don't do my day to day because I've got about 15 or 16 entities and it gets ugly, but they are great and I highly recommend them. And we might have one of their people on the show very soon. And before I forget, let me point out that there is a special report up on wealthformula.com right now, which is legal ways in which you can save thousands of dollars. And it's part of what I've learned from the guys over at uh, Provision. And so if you want that download, go to wealthformula.com and grab that. So back to you though, Dave. So of course you got real estate now and I understand why because I've preached the same thing. Now the question is, real estate is a very broad asset class. Why did you choose multifamily? Good question. As I was getting educated about how the real estate world works and how you could use leverage and other strategies, including cost segregation, which allows you to accelerate a big chunk of the depreciation from a 27 and a half year schedule to a five to seven year schedule, it became pretty obvious to me that multifamily checked a lot of boxes for me. With a little strategy, it can be one of the most attractive tax protection vehicles on the planet. If you have a good team that is familiar with multifamily, the uh, cash flow can be really attractive. And if you can improve the performance on a multifamily asset, as you know, the price for the asset is based on the NOI or the net operating income. With a great team who knows how to make the asset perform, you can enjoy some really good appreciation as well. Yeah, you know, what I think is really interesting, and this is something that I think you and I together as, you know, business guys, not just real estate guys, understand that if you can actually sell a business, you get what we call Called liquidity moment. Okay, liquidity moment is liken it to sort of monopoly money, right? It's not money that we see on an everyday basis, but we see like a huge windfall of money coming from something that we've created. And what Dave's talking about is interesting because you can get sort of these miniature liquidity events of a million, two million bucks at a time by just taking a property and improving it increasing the return on investment and therefore increasing the value of that asset. If you buy it for a couple million dollars, you might end up selling it for two million. Guess what? You've got a huge profit. That's kind of something neat about real estate too that I think people who are in business can appreciate. Dave, tell me about your journey though. You started out obviously is a lone wolf real estate investor and that's kind of about where I am and I'm looking to sort of get into what you're doing as a, a syndicator and you're you're obviously pretty prolific, you know, well-respected guy who's made the rounds here. Tell us what it means to be a syndicator. Why did you become one, etc.? You know, it sounds complicated, but it's really not. It's just simply someone who puts a deal together and he invites multiple investors into the deal with him or her. The main main reason I became a syndicator is because I was having a lot of success in the multifamily space on my own. And about the time when I had acquired a few hundred units myself, along with my partner, Gary, and then I had invited my family to invest in some deals with me, there came a time when I either had to slow down because I was running out of cash, or I had to partner up with folks who had some cash to invest. If you want the best broker, if you want the best guys on your team, you got to perform. And the fear was that, you know, I was getting to the point where I was the guy that was getting the call when that deal came along. So I was at risk of losing that spot if I decided to slow down and not perform as much. I wanted to be that guy, the guy that when the best broker in the city finds a deal, I want that call. So it was about that same time when I was sort of getting tapped out. I bought a couple hundred units on my own along with my partner, Gary, who's also my property manager in Memphis. It was about that time I was invited to sit on the founding board of a local 
startup bank, and I knew most of the other guys on the board, very successful businessmen, many who could have stirred up the check for a half a million to a million bucks. And they were making statements like, this may be five to seven years till we see any kind of return, but it's still better than putting your money into a CD. And I was sitting there, I couldn't believe what I was hearing. These very successful business guys were basing their investment decisions on if they could do better than like 0.02% or something like that. So basically, I found a strong need in the marketplace and I thought syndication would be a great way to bridge the gap for these guys and it turned out to be a big win for both sides. Since then I've branched out and invited lots of other folks to invest alongside of us and you know the interesting thing is I found this is a great team sport. I have a lot more fun investing with a bunch of guys in a syndication than I do with the properties I own myself and I'm you know how much how much fun can you have by yourself? It's just a lot of fun when you can partner up with guys and do deals together and I've really enjoyed it. That's great. I mean obviously you're very successful. Right. I mean, you are one of the guys that I look at and say, you know, there's a guy who's really, really, you know, living sort of the syndicator dream, so to speak. So if you had to say that there was one key to your success, what's that key? Well, there's a couple of things. One is I've been extremely blessed and God's been good to me and our family. And I just, when I look back at the relationship that I've built through syndication, I just, just feel extremely blessed. The other thing is early on, I came to the market with a need of my own. You look back at the first deal that I syndicated, I wasn't known as the real estate syndicator. I was known as the manufacturer, the business guy. I didn't have a, a real estate background. The investing that I had been done before on my own, I was sort of quiet about that. I had never really talked a whole lot to other folks about what I was doing and what kind of money I was making and the deals that we were doing. And, you know, my friends, people around me, my community, nobody really knew what I was up to. So the very first deal I came out, it was really hard for me because nobody knew me as the real estate syndicator and I had to kind of break the ice there. But I think it was kind of a psychological barrier. It was me talking to myself in my head. So, you know, that first deal, I come out of the gates and I need 850 grand. And I sort of approached it as I need to get this deal funded. We're going to benefit through this together and we're going to have a good time together and everybody's going to win. But, you know, I can't out with a need of my own and since then I've switched that whole thing around where you know what this isn't about me this is about the investor this is about adding value to the marketplace this is about adding value to my community and it seems like since I flipped that around to where I took the focus off of me and put the focus on the investor and said you know what how can I add value to this guy's life how can I add value to this busy business owner that doesn't have the time and the resources and the team that I've got, how can I help him? And it seemed at that point when I shifted my focus on how can I add value instead of how can I get this deal done for me when I really got some momentum. What would you tell someone who has, say they have some real estate experience, say they own some apartment buildings or some, you know, four units, whatever, when they feel like I'm doing this, but I really would love to scale and become a real estate syndicator just like Dave Zuck. Now, do you have any advice that you'd give that person? Yeah, I mean, I, I would say find a way to add value to people. Uh, especially people who have busy lives and careers. Uh, you know, like I said, a lot of those people in those situations have more money than time. And, you know, they, they're focused on their career. They're very good at what they do, most of them. They're so focused on their career, you know, they don't have time to go out and make the connections that maybe I've made, build the team that I've built. And if you can be that connector, if you can add value to that person's life, I'd say that's definitely a shortcut. So, you know, as in business, things go wrong and you learn from it and you get a little bit of scar tissue, right? So just for the sake of letting people know that this isn't all roses, that this is a real business, tell me a time when something went wrong and what you learned from it. Great timing. Your, your question <laughs> it's, uh, has some great timing to it. Uh -oh. So we just settled. I mean, I, I just got the wire like uh, a few days ago. We just sold the very worst deal that I ever got in, into, multifamily property. In fact, it's the very, it's the only one that I ever sold. And I took about almost a $550,000 haircut on it. You know, the lesson here is I invested in someone else's syndication, which isn't a bad thing at all. I've invested in lots of other people's syndications, but I invested with the wrong guy. Turns out he was very incompetent. He wasn't able to get the job done. And the sad part is, 
is he's a fairly well-known syndicator and he talks a, a great game and but no it was a very painful experience one of the reasons i invested with him was uh, i was hoping that he would sort of mentor me and my path to syndication success and but it didn't quite turn out that way but you know the good part is i learned a lot the, the biggest takeaway from me is i invested in the wrong team and you know when you invest with a strong team they can normally turn a mediocre or even a bad deal they can normally make something out of that deal if you invest with the right team they can make something out of a deal if you invest with the wrong guys they can screw up a, a really good deal and when i look back over my investment career almost without fail the times when i lost money in a deal was the times when i didn't invest with a team with a really good strong track record of success i used to get all emotional about the deal itself like wow this property spins off a 20 percent cash on cash return let's do this i get all excited but scar tissue <laughs> what you just talked about. I mean, today I'm, I'm much more interested in who my partners are and who's going to make that asset perform because I know if I have a great team, great things will happen. If I don't, they won't. What about for somebody listening to this program, though? Because there's obviously, you know, a number of my listeners are busy professionals and they're not necessarily people who want to become syndicators, but they might be people who want to actually invest with syndicators and as a limited partner. So, this is a really challenging thing, Dave, and I don't know exactly how to tell people how to choose the right team to invest with. Everybody who is in the market of raising money, most people, I should say, because some people are completely incompetent, are going to put their best foot forward. How do you tell the difference between somebody who's for real and who's not? There's a couple ways. One of my rules are I very seldom invest with someone that I don't know. Most likely, if you give me a cold call, you're going to get very far at all. Normally, the people that I invest with have done deals with friends of mine. It's a pretty small world out there, and if you hang around the right people and you hang around successful folks, they're going to share, number one, their relationships. They're going to share, you know, deal flow. So very seldom will I get into a deal with someone that doesn't have some kind of track record with a close friend or somebody that I know well. One of the questions that I'll have for that person that's referring me is made money with this guy. What's the deal like? What has been your experience? You can cut, you can take a lot of hair off the like that. I mean, you can uh, shortcut that process if you invest with someone who uh, has a track record of success and you talk to the people that have invested with them. Yeah, I, I agree with that 100%. And here is, to me, this is one of the big challenges for investors these days. I'm like you. I only invest with guys I know. Dave Zook has a good deal going on. He tells me, gives me a call. I'm very likely to look at where my situation is. And if I've got money to put in the deal, I'll put the money in the deal. But if somebody calls me, Cole calls me and I don't know them, I'm not going to put money in the deal. But here's the problem, right? Is most investors, most professionals and busy professionals, they don't really know who to trust. And that is a real challenge. Now, one of the good things about this show is I'm going to continue to introduce you to guys like Dave. And also what we'll do over time is we are going to layer in something of a forum where we can, uh, it, the listeners of this show can actually go on and talk about their experiences with various investments. And I think it's a great opportunity because what you're going to get from that is exactly what Dave's talking about. It is very difficult to invest in private placements and make money if you don't have somebody else telling you that they've made money with that person before. And so we'll get to the bottom of that. But getting back to you, Dave, most of your success, as I understand it, has been in one market in particular in Memphis. So why did you focus on Memphis and what do you see about the positives there? Well, there's a ton of reasons why I chose Memphis and we certainly don't have time for all of them. But number one, jobs were a big one. Memphis, there's just a ton of blue collar jobs in Memphis. And the kind of jobs in Memphis are the kind that you can't send overseas. A lot of those jobs are distribution or they're based around distribution and medical. And there's some more jobs that can be shipped overseas, but the three that I pay most attention to are distribution, medical, and energy. And years ago, I went on a real estate guy's field trip to Memphis and 
very in-depth field trip and I learned a lot about the market and, and uh, it was a great uh, experience and that's how I got hooked up with Steve Woodyard. He's the number one real estate broker in Memphis and he then introduced me to Gary who's now my partner down there and also my property manager and that's the thing you know when you deal with a first class player most likely he's going to have good people that he can refer you to so you don't have to go down there and you go to any market and, and really focus on building a 10 person team a lot of times you hook up with one or two guys they'll they'll point you in the right direction and, and help you build that team a couple other things one of them is really important is landlord tenant law heavily favors the landlord non-performing tenant they'll be out in 25 days or less i own some student housing in philly and and there it takes me three months to get rid of a non-performing tenant and it's a very expensive process a couple more things the memphis airport is the busiest cargo airport in the world geographic location makes it a very attractive location for shipping there are over 163 truck terminals in memphis memphis has the third largest rail center in the united states it's also on the river it has the fourth largest inland port in the nation and most of these jobs created by this type of industry the shipping industry are blue collar jobs and they make great tenants for us the the upshot of this is really jobs equals good tenants equals a good market to invest in and it sounds like you've got a great place in memphis to do that and and you're getting the best deals there. So now let me ask you this. You know, I've talked a lot about problems in general with the equity markets and the stock market, et cetera, and how I don't think it's a good time to be there necessarily. Even with real estate, I think you're seeing in a lot of markets, you're seeing big tightening the uh, capitalization rates because you're seeing a lot of the big money going from those stock market uh, investments into real estate, into real stuff, and, and therefore it's driving yield down. So why should investors consider investing in real estate right now? Well, the reasons could be different for any one investor. You know, I gave you some of the reasons why real estate was attractive for me, but there are a lot of reasons why real estate could be an attractive option for any investor. And you know, when the job's done right, it can be a great source of supplemental income if you have a job or a career. It can provide you financial freedom. Why now? Well, they say the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago, and the, and the second best time is today. I think it was I think it was Roy Rogers that said, "Don't wait to buy real estate." buy real estate and wait. You know, why, why I don't recommend buying just any real estate at any time, there are still good deals out there today that make a lot of sense. Just make sure that the real estate that you're buying is right for you and make sure you're clear on what you want out of it. You know, the last thing is, when you look at who got wiped out in the last recession, it was people who were buying in hopes of selling to someone in the future for a higher price. We invest for cash flow in an asset that has performed very well, even in recessionary type environments. So I think just be careful, uh, make sure that a lot of the properties that were selling in 2003, 4, 5, and 6, you know, they, those people weren't buying for cash flow. A lot of those properties were cash flow negative. And, you know, that's the properties that we're buying today quite regularly. We're buying properties for, say, two and a half million that investors bought for four million back in 2006. So it's not always about just getting into any real estate, just anytime, anywhere. You've got to be strategic. And while you got to be careful, there's still a lot of good deals out there. So if you approaching an investor, say I call you up and I say, Dave, I've got some money. Tell me about your typical deal. How big is it? What kind of returns could I potentially expect? How does it work? Most of our deals are, I would say, in the, between the two and five million range. There's this space where you get above the million and a half, two million mark, you're now kind of out of range or even the million dollar mark, you're kind of out of range of that mom and pop investor and on the top side of that if you get up into the eight to 15 million dollar range and north of that you become attractive depending on what asset class you kind of become attractive to the institutional buyer you know there's still some really good opportunities and so most of our deals are in that two to five million dollar range and we've been consistently hit between eight and eleven percent cash on cash return and it might not get you all excited these are deals that have some value add component to them so we can take a deal like that and we can take a slightly distressed property something with not a lot of down units but needs just a facelift and some really good tight management and one of the things we do when we go and buy one of these properties on all these properties actually is we install a high-tech surveillance system that's video and audio and we watch every door in the property and what happens is bad people 
hate it. They move out. You don't have to kick them out. They move out. Good people love it. Their kids are safe. Their cars are safe. You know, property is next door. They know they're being watched. Everybody, this property is being monitored. So there's a lot of ways that you can add value to the property and really get an appreciation boost because of it. But I would say typical first year returns, we've been consistently putting out an 8 to 11% cash on cash return. What about a five-year IRR, internal rate of return? North of... 20%. I mean, there's some properties that, you know, we're taking, really adding a lot of value to them. Most of the properties that, that I've syndicated aren't five years old yet. So I started doing this on my own in like 2010, 2011. And then, you know, I went a year or two before I started syndicating the properties. So syndicated properties, we don't have a five-year property yet, but they're performing really well. And all indicators point to being able to, to really do well on, a, on either a sale or a cash out refinance. One of the things you talked about, Dave, is that 8 to 11%. And actually, if you compare that to the bond market, that's pretty good, right? And then the reality is, you know, what is a bond? In many cases, you've got a mortgage wrapped up into something and you, you sell it. So basically, you're buying a bond in a lot of times. Um, so 8 to 11 sounds pretty good. But beyond that, we talked a lot about taxes. If I'm an investor, can you tell our audience what that means? If you get me, say you get me 10% return on investment, typically with leverage, you know, you send me out a K-1 at the end of the year. What does that mean for my taxes? Good question. What we do, and this is, I'm very conscious of most of my investors have the same sort of problem that I had early on. They've got tax issues. I mean, if you're somebody that's accumulated a good bit of wealth and you've got a good strong business, got tax issues. So what we do with all of our properties, we do a close to the end of the year, we'll send a licensed cost segregation guy down to Memphis and he'll do a cost segregation study on all the properties that we have acquired that year. And what that is, basically you're taking a property that would normally depreciate at 27 and a half years. You're taking a, a big portion of that property and you're depreciating that over five to seven years. So now just imagine you've got a hundred grand and you're putting a hundred grand into the deal. We're leveraging you up four to one using the bank's 75% of the bank's money, 20, 25% of the investor's money. We're leveraging you up. You don't have to guarantee the debt. My partner and I always guarantee the debt. So now you're getting the full benefit of your write-offs on say 400,000 and you're also getting the full benefit of this cost segregation study that we're doing on the money that you brought to the table and also the money, also the bank's money. So when you combine leverage and cost segregation study, you add some strategy like that, it can be a powerful tool and it's definitely changed my life. Do you think in many cases what you find investors are getting, you know, these K-1s where basically they're pretty much tax-free or pretty close to tax-free on the investment profits that they're making? Yeah, I mean, we normally figure properties that we syndicate, we normally figure that cash flow for the first five years is tax-free. And just for education purposes, I even have a real-life K-1 from an investor. His name is obviously blotted out, but you know it shows exactly, like in 2014, we bought this property called Harmony Park and showed a $100,000 investment coming from an investor. And it showed that he was making a 10.8% return from the last three months of the year. So we acquired the property in the end of September. So you had October, November, and December that he was getting positive cash flow of 10.8%. With the cost segregation study that we did, the accelerated depreciation, it gave him $18,000 worth of depreciation. So basically what that means, if you're in the uh, 39% or 40% tax bracket, that saved you $7,500 in tax. Well, what happens is that investor on $100,000, 10.8%, that investor didn't even make $7,500 in cash flow. He made about $2,700 in cash flow. So what happens is you have more depreciation that you can use in the first maybe year or two, and you just either can use that depreciation to offset any other passive income, or you can roll it forward to the next year and, and use it down the road. So, I mean, it's a really powerful tool. That's what I was kind of getting at. You know, I just released a special report effectively talking about just what you just said. You know, a lot of people think that they don't have a lot of opportunities to save money in taxes, but we're really talking about ways where you can invest with tax advantages. Now, people might talk about various other investments and you might get a 10% return, et cetera, but you always have to factor in taxes. So if you're paying capital gains on 10%, guess what? A quarter of that's gone. And so it's not 10%. So you really have to look at the real returns. Appreciate that. 
Dave. Now tell me one other thing just for my personal edification. How does tax work for the sponsor on the deal? Because especially if, say, I know typically you would put money in the deal, but what if you didn't put money in the deal and you own 20% of it? How does that work? It, it's always based on basis in the deal. If you got zero basis in the deal, you don't get the benefit of the depreciation. Now, I don't have that problem because I always invest in the deal right alongside my investors. So it's always based on your basis in the deal. If you have a hundred grand invested, you get the write off. And I'm by no means a CPA, but I've I've had these conversations with my CPA and you get depreciation based on your basis in the deal. Fair enough. Dave taking up a lot of your time, but I want to make sure that if people want to talk to you more about what you're doing and maybe they want to talk about syndication in general or maybe they want to invest with you, how can they reach you? Do you have a website, other ways that they can contact you? Yeah, so my email address is Dave at the real asset investor.com. My website is the real asset investor.com, obviously. My phone number is 717 278 2456. And it's actually pretty good timing because I've got the fourth quarter of this year. It looks like there's going to be some activity. So for your listeners, I'd be happy to send out that K1 as an example, the one that I just discussed, showing the tax. Here's the thing it's kind of a brain twister until you kind of get your mind around it, but uh, I'd be happy to send that out to him upon request. So if uh, any of your listeners want to send me an email at dave at therealassetinvestor.com, I'd be happy to send that out as an example. And if you want, listeners, you can also send it to me. If it's easy to remember, buck at wealthformula.com. You can send it to me, and I will forward it to Dave, and we'll get you all the information that you want. Hey, Dave, I hope your ankle is doing well. I know you uh, sprained your or broke your ankle or something like that, and we were going to talk over Labor Day. I hope you're doing better, and um, thank you so much for your time today. And it was really, really helpful. And I, I'm glad my listeners got to listen to a legitimate, you know, ethical syndicator. And if people are thinking about investing in in this asset class, I think Dave Zook's a very good guy to talk to. Thanks, Buck. I really enjoyed it. I love talking about this stuff. So I enjoyed our time together and glad, uh, I hope I added some value to your uh, listeners. Thanks again. Take care, Dave. Thank you for listening to the Wealth Formula Podcast. Visit us on the web at wealthformula.com. The information contained in this podcast are opinions, not fact. As always, consult your own financial team before making any investment. See you next time.